The session title was Games and Participation, which I've twisted slightly to, because I'm still deciding on the title of my thesis, but I think the title of my thesis is going to be Total Play, all caps, exclamation mark. So that's why I've called this presentation that. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I'm John. So I'm, I'm an educationalist um, with a background in philosophy, my, my kind of undergrad and my, my master's are in philosophy. Um, and I've been playing video games since I was five, which is also coincidentally the age at which I entered education and never left. So education and games have, have been happening at the same time, time, as time basically for the last 28 years. Um, I spent last year teaching on the foundation year in education studies in this very building. In fact, I taught quite a lot in this actual room. So as I'm talking about the experiences of students, you can kind of get a feeling for the kind of environment that I'm talking about, because it's this building, basically. Um, yeah, and like Sam said, this is my, my work in progress PhD thesis. Um, it, is, it is very much a work in process. You, you will progress. You'll notice a point in my argument where suddenly everything becomes much more vague. Um, <laughs> and that's because I'm still deciding on some, some bits of it. But it's two thirds of the way there. So, you know, um, yeah. Um, so that's my, that's my research question, according to all the official forms I've, I've filled in. How are play and participation connected? in higher education. Um, my actual research question is something more like, oh, uh, more like that. Um, so it's, it's a, an is ought question. So it's not just how they're connected, but how should they be connected? And I'm talking theoretically and practically and philosophically from the point of view of students and educators and institutions and policy. So it, it, it becomes a much more complicated question. The way I'm explaining it to, to normies, I suppose, is, <laughs> is people talk about higher education being a game all the time. It gets used as, you know, oh, it's, you know higher education is a game, and we've got to figure out how to, how to play it. Um, I'm basically taking that metaphor super seriously and, and following it to its logical conclusion to try and decide kind of, well, if, if higher education is a game, what sort of game is it and how do you win, basically. Um, like I said, this is a work in progress, so um, I've got some questions for you. <laughs> so does this all make sense, basically, from your discipline and background? I'm, I'm an educationalist slash philosopher, but I, be, I know that a lot of people in this room are involved in education from other subjects. So I'm really interested in, in, in how, that, how that fits with you, especially as lots of you are more games researchy than I am. Um, so if there's anything I've missed on that front, that would be great. Um, and where should I go next? Because like I said, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, my conclusions really are the kind of practical implications of this, and that's the bit I'm not sure about yet. I'm very good at thinking about things, I'm just not very really clear on what I actually do. Um, so, so where should I go next, and what do you think, um, what do you think should happen next? I've said be nice there, but I know that you'll be nice. Um, yeah. Um, so, I'm, this is going to follow the structure of my thesis to a large extent, so I apologise that I kind of have to do... I'm playing the game of the thesis by, you know, by demonstrating... So the first thing you have to start with is a literature review. Um, and the way I'm framing my literature review is in terms of the two ideas that I've got, participation and games slash play. Um, and the literature reveals that participation is generally seen as a problem, an educational problem. And the, the kind of way that you can understand that is by looking at the, the related idea of wi widening participation. So widening participation is the question of the social composition of universities, who participates in university. And as a social justice question, it's, it's all about kind of widening participation. So, so encouraging those who wouldn't traditionally participate in university to participate. How do we do that? What is the, what is the point of doing that? Um, and what, what you end up with is a set of policies and practices. So you've got sort of big policy documents like that, like from um, Hefke, which doesn't even exist anymore, and the Office for Students that kind of give, give orders to universities and other, other higher education institutions to say this is what you're expected to do to widen participation and make university a, 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 a more socially diverse place. Um, and that's been, a, that's been, since universities have existed, that's been an issue, but it's become more of an issue since kind of the 1990s onwards as universities have become sort of more um, driven by kind of market forces, I suppose. Um, there's been a bit more of a, a shift more recently for it to be less, just as much as it's a question of who's participating in university, who gets in, it also then becomes, and do those underrepresented groups 
get as good grades as other groups. So, so you look at the input going coming to university, and nowadays there's also a focus. The latest policy document from OFS is around how do you make sure that your your less traditional students are still getting good grades at the end. Um, there are the critical approaches. So Louise Archer and, and others write about widening participation kind of critically talking about how actually a lot of the time when we when we have widening participation policy what we're doing is we're, we're viewing those students as a problem so this is kind of come back comes back to that again the, the idea that we're 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 saying you as as prospective students do not fit our ideal and the job of widening participation policy is to make you more like our ideal student make you more like the middle class kids who who normally apply to university and get in and get good grades um, and, and some critical approaches, like those kind of uh, pr proposed by Archer, take, a, take an approach that's more around how you, how you engage those students on their own terms, and it, become, it becomes less of a process of changing them and more of a process of changing the university in response to them. To kind of swerve, you can, if that's a problem, then games are traditionally seen as something of a solution. And the way you see that is in games and play-based learning. So there's tons of books written about games and their use in education, and it's always about, here's what games are useful for in education. So games, according to G, are good for building affinity spaces, which allow kind of people to you know, engage in a social process of learning. Um, ba Sasha Barab and others have written about constructing video games that are virtual worlds, simulations of things that couldn't exist in the real world. Um, you've got my supervisor, Nick Witten, who talks about um, games as a good way of, of having kind of a safe space to fail. But the, but the upshot is that often um, that games are used for a specific purpose. Um, and often that is tied to kind of a very technological view of what games are. So, so games, as much as games have been around for thousands of years since the ancient Egyptian board game Senate, um, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, a, a link between games and technology. Often it's the technologists who are introducing games into education. And they're not necessarily video games, they might be, might be analog games, but it's the technology that's driving that process. Um, even the kind of more playful approaches, so the, the approaches that don't use games necessarily, but take a kind of playful approach, like what Nick's doing nowadays, um, are often about the skills and the social processes of play. play. Play increases creativity, play increases engagement, that kind of thing. So, so given both of those, the obvious thing to do would be to say, well, OK, if participation is a problem and games are a solution, why don't we try using games to solve the problem of, of, of widening participation? And that hasn't really been done, and that was kind of my, oh, I think I might have, have a go at that. That was my RD1, here is what I proposed to do on my PhD at the beginning. But I haven't done that. Um, because I got caught up in this idea of, of the, the logic of problems and solutions. So neoliberalism in HE, neoliberalism is this kind of, the, the idea that economic principles of the market are driving public institutions. Um, in order to increase kind of personal freedom and efficiency and that kind of thing, um, means, means that everything in education is seen as a problem or a solution. Um, and there's a, that, that's kind of one, the only way often that people, people think um, about these things. So, so I was thinking about you know, that phrase, whenever you, if you've only got a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. But I think conversely, if, you've only, if you can only see nails, then everything looks like a hammer as well. So, you know, people in HE are, are surrounded by hammers and nails, basically, and, and that is the only way of thinking about things that they can do. And, and, and this is tied into an idea of the student as a kind of consumer, um, as the archetype, where, they, where, they're co where they're concerned with what they're getting for their money, having paid, you know, six grand or nine grand or whatever for their, for their course. University, even if they don't actually act like that, so Richard Budd has actually done some research to find out that students don't really behave like cons consumers, but as long as institutions treat them like they behave like consumers and this this logic of problems and solutions um, remains um, so and, and if games have a use under here it's the games of economic game theory it's games that where everyone is behaving rationally and everyone is trying to um, uh, to win basically um, and gamification I think is the archetypal example so gamification is where you take game like systems to provide incentives and change behaviors um, Chris Bateman calls it the workification of games. So it's using games in work contexts in order to sort of drive the kind of 
let's solve problems, let's, let's improve outcomes kind of thing. Um, John Ferrara, Ferrar, I think his name is, um, says that this is basically strip mining games. It's taking all the useful things out of games and ignoring the fun stuff, which is quite a kind of cynical way of looking at it. So one, as soon as I kind of got into this, I started to think, well, how can you actually change, um, how can you move away from this logic of problems and solutions and think about participation as play, participation and play as they're actually experienced rather than as this kind of theoretical toolkit to be used. Um, so I went away and started thinking about them separately. So in, part, in terms of participation, there are loads of related ideas like engagement and inclusion and transition, and all these things are, st are still read in similar terms as a problem that needs to be solved. Um, but if you start looking at participation outside of formal education, start looking at people like Leibn Wenger or Kolb or, or even sort of critical pedagogy from Freire, you, you get this idea that, that learning exists beyond, beyond the institution and beyond the kind of the levers that the institution is using. Um, and even these, even these sort of more these these ways of learning actually get um, abused by institutions. So they get so so they'll take a theory like this and think it's a tool that can be used. You know, oh yeah, situated learning theory. Right, we're going to use that as a way of making people learn now. Instead, what I'm interested in from these are the ways in which they actually just, they, they they take a real interest in what people actually do when they learn. It's le it's not about what they produce. It's not about what they're where they came from, it's the process happening in the middle of what actually is learning, participating in learning, doing. And similarly, if you look at play and games theory, it's, it, there's a similar thing. So there's loads of different theories of play, psychological, cultural, or philosophical. So you've got people like Suits and Calois and Herzinger. Um, the, the psychological ones and, the, and, the and actually the cultural ones as well tend to focus on kind of... Um, defining play and classifying play experiences so play does this or play exists in these four different ways or something like that so the classic one is Calois who divides kind of play into four different types of play um, the, a lot of the issues a lot of my issues with these is they, they kind of predate the kind of growth of player culture off the back of video games and stuff like that and they, they have a very kind of masculine, hyper-masculine kind of competitive conception of what play is all about. Um, even Suits, who I kind of tend towards, is a little bit like that. They write about sport a lot. They write about, um, they write about chess, chess and sport, and the two things that they were, they were sort of constantly thinking about. And I, that's quite a broad stroke, and there is a lot of nuance there. But, but I, I'm, often, I'm often thinking, well, what, what would they say about... I don't know, Fortnite, what would they say about, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a, the sort of popular video games nowadays? What I found really interesting is actually going, moving into something about what, is, what players actually experience. And that's where you get into ethnographies of player culture. So building on Richard Jenkins' participatory culture, which is a book all about fandom, about fans who create stuff like writing fan fiction and... Um, and that's quite an early one, 1992, but it's kind of, I think he writes a lot around people writing Star Trek fan fiction and that kind of thing. But then off the back of that, lots of people like Celia Pierce and T.L. Taylor have written ethnographies of the culture within video games. So, so Celia Pierce writes about um, MMORPGs, these mass multiplayer online games, and, and the communities that are built within that. And she re looks really seriously at, from the inside as a player, what actually happens in those communities. C.L. Taylor writes about um, the auxiliary tools that occur beyond playing a game, so writing the guides and the wikis and taking part in the kind of Tumblr culture and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I got really interested in what happens if you take that sort of approach to education? What, what if you look at all the things that are happening around education in the same way? So that's kind of where I, where I got to. So I, I decided that I'd go right back to the roots of participation, which is literally being or becoming a part of something, and that implies that there's a context you're a part of and there are other people in that because you're only a part, there must be others in there as well. And so I've kind of got this situated idea of participation that's wider than, than, what, what, than what widening participation would, would include. Because widening participation just seems to be are you at university or not and have you passed or not. This is, you're at university, what are you actually doing? What are you actually taking part in? Um, and the similar thing with play, I think play is basically a mode of situated participation. It's a way of participating in things. So I'm drawing upon the kind of more critical views of uh, Miguel Sicar, even Bernie de Coven, 
um, which is that they understand play as a relationship within players and the rules. And the, the important thing is that the players are the important part of that. They're the ones who establish the rules in the first place. They're the ones who decide what the rules are, are covering. I actually ended up going down the route of Thomas Malaby, who has a kind of philosophical version of what de Koven's. So de Koven's all about how the players change the game, how the players um, enact kind of changes in the rules by cooperating with each other even when they're meant to be competing and that kind of thing. Um, Thomas Malaby describes games as processual rather than artifactual. So games aren't a thing, they're a process. Um, he actually describes them as semi-bounded, socially legitimate domain of contrived contingency. And I really like this idea of contrived contingency that, that we've all kind of agreed that we're, we're, in, we're engaging in a process that kind of depends on each other, but it's kind of a social, a social process. What I end up thinking really about is rather than just thinking about play or games, I'm thinking about the idea of game play. That is play within a set of rules that could be described as a game. Like I said, if we're talking about higher education as a game, that you know, this metaphor of the game, then what's the game play like there? Um, getting my head around all of this, this is, this is kind of the traditional way of viewing this kind of problems and solutions. There are a list of things that are problems, there are a list of things and solutions. And you can connect participation and play-based learning by linking those two together. Um, that's what I've actually done, <laughs> um, which is just kind of look at the concepts and all the things they're connected to and try and make a kind of weird route around the edges rather than across the middle. The way I kind of saw that is this is the map. This is really bad, bad resolution, but this is the only I can find. This is the, this is the map from Assassin's Creed Unity, which came out in 2014, which is a bad game. Um, and it's the map is covered in activities for you to do and the plot of the game wants you to go from this activity to this activity and that is you know but actually they've given you so much to do and it's such a mess of symbols and you don't really know what you're doing that you end up just sort of running these loops around Paris desperately trying to find something fun to do and that's kind of how I approach writing my literature review <laughs> I wanted it to be I wanted it to be more fun than 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 academia would suggest it should be so yeah that's that's where we got to on that it's all linked together as well um, through pragmatism, which is the kind of philosophical background that I'm, I'm coming from. Really quickly, I can't give you a, a, a massive lesson on pragmatism because it's, it's a complicated philosophy. But ultimately, that pragmatism is, a, is, a, is basically arguing that philosophers often ask the wrong question. Philosophers often ask, how do we have knowledge of the world around us? Pragmatism says, well, we, we know we have knowledge of the world around us. What do we actually do with it? That's, that's the important question. So in experience, communication, and democracy are the kind of central values of John Dewey's conception of pragmatism. Um, experience kind of makes us and changes us. We then communicate that with other people, and that leads to that implies at, at the heart that we need to have democratic ways of doing things so that we can have a diverse number of experiences and, and we can make sure that our knowledge is actually doing something in the world. I mean, the quote I always go back to from, from Dewey is, democracy begins in conversation. So he wants to build um, philosophical discussion, not because um, he just wants to sit and stroke his chin and kind of be pretentious, but actually that is the root of actually changing the world and, and having more democratic outcomes. My argument was actually that you could kind of have a, uh, all of those things, even though it's called pragmatism, it can be quite a playful philosophy, and I've got a really long argument about this that I can't go into right now, but pragmatism is a misnomer because it suggests sensibleness and being kind of, and doing what works. And I get so fed up with Theresa May constantly going on about how pragmatic she is because she's not a pragmatist, because she's not playful. Um, and she's doing the wrong thing, and you know, anyway. Um, so um, the idea is that, I mean, Richard Rorty writes about pragmatism and says that it's got this spirit of playful experimentation. The whole point of pragmatism is that you, as a philosopher, as a teacher, as, any, as whatever you're doing, need to explore alternatives all the time. You need to be constantly looking for other ways of doing things, because that's the only way you can kind of break out of habits and actually discover anything new. Um, I've got another game analogy for this. So this is Mysterium, um, which I've played with a few of you before. Or any game where you have to communicate without, where your communication is limited. So Pictionary could be another example where you're forced to draw and you can't talk. In all of these games, you have to establish quite quickly with the, with the group that you're with the rules of what you're going to do. So it can, you have to establish how you're going to communicate on the fly. And often that leads to frustration and confusion and people getting things wrong 
And that's what pragmatism is all about. Pragmatism admits that we're often going to get things wrong, but experimentation is the only way that you can actually um, find the correct way of doing things. If you sat down at, at Pictionary, got something wrong, and then stopped playing because you got it wrong, that would kind of end the process. This is a continual process of renew, renewing and negotiation and practice being at the heart of what we're doing. So that's philosophical stuff, um, which leads to something like design-based research, autoethnography, critical pedagogy, and critical discord analysis all at the same time, um, which is kind of the methods that I've used this year or last year. Design-based research because I did design and experience for my students, and I was interested in what, what it would do. Um, that's the kind of legacy of Dewey, who was a, an educationalist and did set up schools where he tried out experimental methods. But importantly, I'm not claiming that this is going to lead to a replicable correct answer, because I think that that's too, um, too much for education and research to do. It's also ethnography, it's also ethnography because it's about finding out what students' experiences are, but it's autoethnography because I'm in the middle of things and I'm looking at my own practice as a researcher and teacher. So I'm trying to make sure that I've kind of, I've kind of, I'm reflecting critically on what I'm doing. And that links it to critical pedagogy because I'm also trying to do something that's overtly political. I'm trying to do something that's um, kind of, going to enact change in the world. And linked to that is critical discourse analysis. I'm interested in what my students are saying and where they've got these ideas from. And one of the things you'll see is that they've really bought into a lot of the discourse that I need to critique. I've also bought into it myself, as we'll see. So there's, there's kind of, um, there's quite a lot to kind of unpack there. Give you a bit of context of what I actually did. Um, so I taught in the foundation year, there's about 80 students on the foundation year. And the, and the foundation year is a kind of, it's an entry level degree. So it's designed as a year long experience for students who haven't gotten into a full degree for some reason or other. So this is widening participation in action. This is literally a course that is designed for non-traditional students. And they come from a variety of backgrounds and they come from, they're, they're not on a full degree for a variety of reasons. Some um, have not got the grades they expected and are kind of having that, that year of kind of resetting and figuring out what they're gonna do. Some have come from a background where they didn't even consider university, and maybe it's 10 years later and they've been in the real world and now they, now they want to study. Um, some have been working in education and actually want to train as teachers, and this is, a, this is the next step for them. The idea is that it's, it's a year, it's kind of like an, a, a year-long induction into what universities do. So the course is very kind of slow motion, very considered. It's very much about them bringing their own experiences to bear and practicing some of the academic skills that they might not have. The, the important thing is that anyone who passes a year is guaranteed a place on the full degree in education or in early years the next year. So this is literally a widening participation strategy. Um, I taught on a course on the course called Foundations of Academic Practice, which is all about the skill sets that you need to do a degree. So it's all about the reading skills, the writing skills, the critical analysis skills, that kind of thing. Um, so I see, I see that group every, I see 40 students, so half a year group every Thursday. I was also a personal tutor for another 15 students who I didn't teach for Foundations of Academic Practice. And again, we have really strong pastoral support on the foundation year, so I saw them every week for an hour. Um, and I marked all their work as well, no matter who they were writing it for. So I got to really know those students. Um, from those students, about 12 were directly involved in my research, but I was also reflecting on the, my practice with the entire cohort at the same time. And they all knew of it. They kind of had read, uh, at the very beginning of the year, I told them all what I was doing and they were all quite invested in my research. But about 12 were directly involved and we'd meet for fairly regular focus groups so that um, I'd, to find out their kind of attitudes towards things. I was also interested in this idea of doing playful research with them. So I often, towards the end of the year, we stopped sitting in a room and discussing things and we went out and did stuff. So I'd say, you know, go out and um, find out as much as you can about how people get in and out of the building or something like that. And that actually, and that, that raised a lot of questions for them. They were kind of being active participants for anyone who came into this building knows that those front doors are permanently broken and it becomes a big, access issue because you can never actually get into the building and that became a big discussion for us and we that le that led into conversations about how you got into university that kind of thing um i also used to just rant bring in dice and we'd throw dice around to decide what questions we we're going to ask so, like trying to loosen up and trying to get a bit more play in there um i call that opportunism because in the end actually the focus groups went out the window and it was literally 
oh, have you got five minutes? Let's have a discussion now about that. What that thing that you just raised in discussion, I think would be really interesting. So we can, so it became kind of a lot of ad hoc conversations, a lot of capturing things that they said in sessions and that kind of thing. Um, I should say that a lot of this playful stuff then fed back into the teaching. So towards the end of the year, I was teaching with the same sort of methods. We were doing a lot of um, using games in the classroom and that kind of thing, which was part of my original design. But um, I found that, um, well, you'll see that I found that different students reacted to that in different ways and it became a little bit more nuanced than just, just using games in the classroom. The way I read all that is through two conceptual models at the same time. <laughs> so, so I was... You, from the kind of participation end of things, I went back to Leven Wenger and their idea of legitimate peripheral participation. So they're writing about informal learning in kind of real world contexts. And they are, their argument is that learning occurs through increased participation in a community of practice. Um, how do I, as a newcomer to, that, to one of those communities, become kind of inculcated in, the, in the, the formal and informal ways of doing things in that group? Um, and that, their argument is it's all about logistics, so it's working on the edges of that, of that community and gradually working your way towards some sort of centre. That being legitimate because you're often taken under the wing of someone who, who has more experience. Um, the other um, model is the Magic Circle, which comes from Jaren Heisinger and is then picked up by Saal and Zimmer and kind of popularised by Saal and Zimmer, Zimmer in the 21st century. Um, the Magic Circle is, is, is kind of a, a similar model but it applies to play. So Herzinger briefly, literally in a paragraph in one of, one of his books mentions this concept of the magic circle. Um, it's a playground marked off either material, materially or ideally, deliberately or as a matter of course. So the idea that play occurs within a, a sort of sacred space that's safe from the rest of the world. Um, lots of people read that as kind of this sort of very impermeable kind of solid circle. I'm more interested in it as an, as an idea that there is definitely a difference between playing and not playing, and there's a kind of weird, vague boundary between the two. Um, and that's kind of where I got into, because I realised that what these two models have in common is that they're both about rules. So what are the rules of the game we're playing, if it's a metaphorical game or, or if, even if it's a real game? Um, what does the circle look like? So who is in the circle? What does it encompass? What sort of things do I do to get nearer to the centre of that circle? How do I stay on the edge of that circle? Where do the edges overlap with other circles as well? So one of the things that I'm interested in is how participation in one thing affects participation in another thing. And you'll see that with some of the things that students say that often you can't just be at university. You're, you're doing lots of other things as well. And I'm also interested in the idea of magic. Where does the inexplicable stuff happen? Like learning is a really complicated, messy process that sometimes things just can't be explained. Sometimes things are just kind of magic and they just happen. Um, and I'm interested in capturing when students especially kind of see magic happening in what they're doing. So I've got three kind of bits of results on this. The first bit is about what the students said, um, which requires a little bit of introduction. I got interested in the idea of play styles. So play styles came, came, come across from Richard Bartle, who writes this um, idea of um, that there are different ways of playing a game. And he's writing about very early multiplayer computer games called multi-user dungeons. And he has four different play styles called socializers, explorers, um, achievers, I think, and killers. And, and they all do different things. So socializers like to play with other people. Um, killers like to kill other people, explorers like to explore the world on their own, and achievers like to just win the game on the conditions that they've been given. Um, that, that whole idea has is, is taken off and, and lots of people have written things inspired by Richard Bartle. He, he importantly is arguing that actually in a, within a game you need a kind of ecosystem of all those different playstyles. You can't design a game just for killers, because killers depend upon having people who get annoyed at being killed, you know. Um, or, you know, explorers depend upon other people taking care of the other things in the map while I go off and explore. I, just, I thought this is a really interesting metaphor for how students participate in their learning. So I started to think, okay, education's a game. How are these students playing it? And I identified kind of four play styles and one not play style um, through what I'm... And this was mainly through talking to students, through observing what they're doing. So the first play style I kind of identified is... All of, these are, all of these are in terms of the, what they think the rules of the games are, game are and what, the, what their relationship to the other players are often. And, and that is often in terms of the magic circle. So playing to win is kind of the, 
the classic neoliberal student as, con as consumer kind of thing. So the, what the, one, the best quote I found for this from my interviews is a student saying, I want my degree, I'm not paying six grand to sit at home. So it's very much, I have paid for this, I want results, I want to get something out of this. There is only one way to play this game and that is to get the maximum, maximum score at the end of it on that exam. Um, and in a way, all the other people taking part in this game are my competition. I am competing with everyone else who's playing this game. And whether or not that, that might be I'm competing right now, or it might be I'm competing when we've all graduated and we're all applying for the same jobs as each other. But it, in any case, there is a, that is a way of think, that students think about what they're doing at university. There's playing for fun, which is a little bit more nuanced, because, and I think this particular one existed especially on an education course, because this was about getting into that kind of playful mindset, um, almost like a child would play. And often it was framed in those terms. So often students would play for fun because they wanted to experience what, their, what their, the young children they would eventually work with would experience. So the, this, is kind of a, this is a reaction to one of the playful challenges I gave them in a, in a, in a session. Are we going to, I don't know why he wants us to do this, but okay, off we go. Is that kind of like, let the game just take me away and I'm going to have fun with it and see what happens. Um, this really came across in those students who'd lived in the real world and who were more mature and who maybe had families outside. That university became an escape for them. It was, it was, a, it was a, a circle away from the real world. Um, and, and often they were more into this, this play style is more cooperative. It's more about learning from others and being part of a community. One of my students kept talking about how great the community was and how, she, how safe she felt in this community. And that really came across to me that it was, it was like being in a kind of primary school classroom where everyone's kind of free playing, you know, that kind of idea. Um, the next one's called playing the game, which is kind of similar to playing for fun, but it's a bit more cynical. The quote there, it is what it is, was literally the catchphrase of one of my students. He, he would say, oh, it is what it is, all the time. And this idea that he kind of understood critically that sometimes things weren't perfect and sometimes, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing this, I don't really want to do it, but it is what it is, you know. Um, it was an opportunity, and, and often it, playing the game involved bringing in your own identities. And so, so these students really excelled at kind of reflective tasks where they had to talk about their previous learning. They really got, oh, I know how to turn previous learning into something within the game. I can, I can use this. Um, they begin to kind of negotiate with the rule systems. They begin to see how powerful they are as players. So the one, I, the one example I've got is that we have a really stupid attendance system here um, that is far too... You, from the outside, it just looks like it makes very illogical decisions about which students it's going to contact about their attendance. And so I had students who were very, very good attenders who missed one session and suddenly were getting bombarded with emails saying, you haven't attended this session. And the way in which they responded to that was often to just suddenly click and think, oh, actually, I'm, I'm going to ignore that. That is a rule that I don't have to follow. That is a rule that doesn't matter because as long as I'm getting what I want out of this, as long as I'm playing the game on my terms, maybe I don't have to worry about disobeying that rule and breaking that rule. So it, it kind of became for them a kind of way of empowering themselves. And that kind of starts to bleed into what I call counterplay, which is where you literally ignore the rules of the game. And you literally, as close as you can get to cheat in education. And cheating is quite difficult in education because obviously, you know, all these things are against the rules. But it's about starting to bend the rules. So does being in education kind of make you want to break the rules because you're so confined? I don't know. More often than not, students talk about bending rather than breaking rules. But it's kind of playing against the rules, pushing against the system, that kind of typical kind of critical approach um, to, to learning so that you're, you're kind of constantly, you can kind of, as an edu experienced education, you can tell when someone's counterplaying because they're probably sat at the back grinning at something. They're probably like, and you think, why are you grinning like that? What are you thinking? You know, it's that kind of approach. So they, they kind of know, they've kind of figured out what they're doing, you know. Often this was more hypothetical than not. And I should say actually that playing to win was often more hypothetical than not as well. Not many students actually w did play to win. As much as they talked about playing to win, when you actually looked at their behaviour, it was much more in the middle. Um, but when we got into discussions about cheating, you would not believe the things that my students said they could do if they wanted to cheat. They came up with some amazing strategies for cheating, but didn't actually do them. Um, I also identified this kind of thing called not playing, which... which 
I realised when I was thinking about this that actually there's loads of different ways of not playing. And we think about non-participation, but actually there's a non-participation of not turning up in the first place. There's a non-participation of turning up and sitting at the back with your arms folded. There's a non-participation of, of being at home watching the lecture capture um, and submitting everything perfectly and getting really good grades, but somehow never being a part of the group. So, so I wanted to take a more... I haven't really had space to discuss this, but there's definitely a more nuanced way. I even had students who who would participate as far as my playful activities and then just stop. And that was the line they wouldn't cross was engaging in my playful activities. They got the great grades, they did all the cool stuff, but as soon as I asked them to do anything playful, no. Even they would engage in the research and like get really involved in my research project, but then just not do the playful bit of the research because <laughs> that was their limit. That was what they didn't want to do. Um, and I find that really interesting because, it, because often we can be quite monolithic about that, that, that person is not participating, but actually there's loads of different ways of thinking about it. Um, I should say, there isn't, th these aren't like classifications of students, these are classifications of behaviour. So this one and this one, that's the same student in the same discussion, saying those two different things. So, it, so often it was students switching between different play styles and, think, and saying things that seemed inconsistent, but actually... Um, so this is, a, um, this is an example of one student's entire kind of, you know, this is a whole paragraph that they had in, in a bit of written, um, written paper. I think university is like a game because when the end goal is to get the degree, which seems like playing to win. That's when you win. I guess with university, and, and like during the game, you can either do it yourself or you can work with other people. So that's starting to turn into playing for fun by encouraging them and build them up. I don't think anyone in this game are trying to bring people down and hinder them from getting a degree. That's thinking about the possibility of counterplay, even if you're not doing it yourself. I mean, I don't see that happen. We're all trying to build each other up or just do it by ourselves. So then switching back to playing to win at the end to reach the same, same end goal. Um, there's le so, so it was quite nuanced the way students actually discuss this stuff. And what I began to realise is that shifting play styles is a form of learning. And actually being in a position where you can change your position on the rules of the game and understand the game to the extent that you can change how you play it is a form of learning in the same way. I mean, that's kind of following what Avon Wenger say about how people learn informally in those communities. So that's kind of one of my key conclusions. I've also got this idea in my head of, of what I was doing whilst all of this. And I was trying to get away from the idea that I was a designer producing replicable, hygienic and separate outcomes. And that the teaching bit of me and the research bit of me were completely separate. Actually, it all ended up kind of mashing together. So I got some different metaphors for um, to, for what I was doing as an education researcher. So I, I could be a, a dungeon master, like in Dungeons and Dragons, where I've, I've designed an experience, but I'm also participating in that experience. And I'm often improvising and personalising things, depending on what people want. If I am playing a game, then maybe, like with Assassin's Creed Unity, I'm playing a bad open world game where I have to go out of my way to find the fun. And actually, the best way of playing the game is to break it. And this, is, this really spoke to me as someone who has inherited a load of institutional ways of doing things that you have to kind of fight against to some extent if you actually want to be a good educator. Or maybe I'm just a fan. Maybe, maybe I'm not really doing anything. Maybe I'm playing vicariously through my students. They're the ones doing the playing the game and I am supporting them. I'm cheering them on. I'm critiquing them. Maybe my thesis is kind of an elaborate work of fan fiction about my students. I don't know. But, but there's like, there's, there's a load of different metaphors there. So I was trying to find a way of tying all these metaphors together. And that's where we get to social football. And that's where we get to our title. So this is the, this is the, the final verse of, of, a, of a song by Parquet Courts, which came out last year. Uh, Solving parts and roles is not acting, but rather emancipation from expectation. Collectivism and autonomy are not mutually exclusive. Those who find discomfort in your goals of liberation will be issued no apology. And fuck Tom Brady. Um, Tom Brady being the quarterback for the New England Patriots, there's, a, there's an interview um, with the lead singer of, of Parquet Courts, he says about Tom Brady. Um, there's Tom Brady, the player, which is unpopular because he plays the New England Patriots, which is a powerhouse team. But then there's Tom Brady, the symbol, which is what I'm talking about. The lone wolf alpha male quarterback idea of a traditional independent American masculinity that we're all rejecting in that song. It's Tom Brady, the concept. Every sport has their Tom Brady. Every civilization has their Tom Brady. I wanted to, and this, this kind of really spoke to me because I was thinking about a way of combining the political stuff I've already been thinking about, participation, the kind of game stuff, the fact that I just like punk music as well, you know, so it all kind of come, came together. So I started reading up about Total Football and Total Football was a, was a strategy utilised 
in, especially by the Dutch national team, but also quite by quite a lot of teams in the 1970s. Basically, it's about position switching. So it's about the idea that any outfield player can play in any other position. Um, so it's constantly moving, constantly flexible, constantly reacting to things. But it's also a kind of collective um, strategy because it, it, it depends on if I vacate a position, then another player comes in and takes my place. So everyone is kind of fluidly moving around each other. It's called total because it kind of totalizes the team and everyone on the team is doing the same job. But, I mean, if there's a book by David Winner called Clock, uh, Clock, Clock, Brilliant Orange, sorry, which is absolutely fantastic. He argues that it's a product of Dutch politics of the 1960s and 70s. The political climate in Holland was such that everything was total. Everything was about everything else. So and this is where that kind of idea of the overarching metaphor comes in for me, because total football is actually a really good metaphor for, ev for lots of other things that aren't total football. It was democratic, literally democratic. They ran the teams as democracies. Everyone got a vote you know, on who the captain was going to be. Um, it was also really inconsistent. So it, was, it produced absolutely brilliant football. And then Holland lost the 1974 World Cup final against the team that, that was playing regular old football against West Germany. So, and lots of people argued it was accidental. No one really knows who invented it. No one really knows um, where it came from. No, people have taken it and tried to use it as a strategy and it has worked but it's kind of lost the spirit of 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 total football i got thinking about this on, and that's what led me to the idea of total play which is this is the vague bit that i'm writing at the moment so how do we do position switching in education um i'm interested in sort of play with a purpose but not a purpose that's an instrumental neoliberal purpose um but Position switching is kind of that kind of democratic exercise in participation, emancipation from expectation, as Par Parquet Courts would, would call it, of allowing students to play in whichever way they, they want to play or feel that they should play. Um, it's perfectly valid to want to win the game in conventional terms, but it's also perfectly valid to want to do something else, um, as long as you have a critical understanding of why you're doing that and, and how you're doing that. And also position switching comes in in that maybe I want to learn from the students and maybe the students are the experts in something maybe i need to step back and let them take over from me sometimes um, it's total in that it affects everyone in the context and every and all the other things that they encounter so all the magic circles that you're a part of start to overlap it isn't just about you being in university and university being a separate thing maybe your work in university affects what's happening in your job maybe my work as a researcher is affecting my teaching practice it should be but sometimes you know that's frowned upon weirdly um, maybe, um, maybe the kind of uh, the work that the university does is impacting the local community in different ways. That's that's the kind of idea. It's also inconsistent in that we have to if it, we're going to have to come up with different ways of thinking about success in education, um, and that's the really uncomfortable bit, or at least being critical of approaches. So, what is it to win education? The neoliberal way of thinking about it is that you get the highest grades and the highest paid job when you leave but there's so much more to explore and, and that's and the, a more democratic way of thinking about education is to, is to think about well what, what happens if we start to redefine success and start to think differently about um, the game that we're playing this kind of all leads me to think this is the bit that I'm really struggling to get my head around at the moment that at some point total play stops being a metaphor so all this, all the way through, we've been thinking about games as ah, university is like a game. That's a really apt metaphor to describe what we're doing. But actually, this isn't a metaphor. This is this is what's really happening, um, or what we really want to happen. And if you're using games as a metaphor for university, you're at a disconnect from reality to the extent that you can kind of stop changing the game. It becomes like oh, it's just a game, isn't it? Ha ha. And then so let's not bother changing it. You know. Whereas if we're not, if if university literally is a game when we become far more empowered as players to change it and to do, do the total thing. Um, and that's pragmatism in action, actually. That's ultimately what pragmatism is all about. It's, it's about communicating with other people, encouraging them to participate, and through communication and participation, reality literally changes. That is the extent, you know, it's an epistemological change. Um, so I've said here, calling something a game makes it one, and as soon as we acknowledge that the game is real rather than just metaphorical, then we can actually change it through participating. That's kind of one of my, one of my big claims. Um, conclusions? I, I don't really know. <laughs> I, I've got, I realise this argument is really paradoxical and I've said things that don't, so I've talked about metaphors that aren't metaphors and that play that isn't play and play is being serious and silly at the same time. 
And also, I know that there's nothing more frustrating to other players than insisting you weren't trying to win in the first place. Um, and I realise that that is kind of what I'm starting to do in my conclusion. But I think there might be some practical applications, and you can kind of take your choice depending on whether you're into game-based learning. Or, and I don't know who I'm writing for yet, so I'm kind of stuck on this. But from a game-based learning perspective, I think it means designing games that can be played totally. It means anticipating that people are going to break the games that you play and that the breaking itself is a fun way of learning and that maybe we need to actually design games that can be broken. Um, from a participation perspective, which is a much bigger question, um, it's about rebuilding a kind of democratic relationship with success criteria and, and what the rules of the game are and trying to think about the different ways that everyone can participate in different ways and also what we as educators are learning while we're, while we're doing that. So we're not the experts anymore. How do we interrogate some of our kind of academic ideals so that we're not kind of just trying to be Socrates all the time? Um, yeah, so I'm still thinking about that, obviously. But I, did, I definitely know that one of the things I've learned is that university is the real world. It's not separate. It has to be the real world. But games are also the real world. So... You know, games aren't separate, university's not separate, it's all just a big mess. And it's about what we do with that mess, I guess. Yeah. Okay, I'm done.